Except that I immediately go, given that I have my mental map that I'm carrying around now. And um, so immediately I go to fear um, and the sense of the, that the dominant map telling us that somehow we're lacking big time and that we are in a competitive struggle over inadequate resources makes us feel competitive toward everything, uh, toward one another and certainly toward other species. <coughs> So rather than taking a deep breath and celebrating that we inhabit this beautiful earth with so many different organisms, as I, I quote E.O. Wilson in the introduction, saying, we are not only living in a habitat, we are a habitat. As he points out, you know, the billions of microorganisms that, that inhabit us. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that sense of, this is the eco-mind shift from the sense that we are disconnected from one another, disconnected from nature, and we are all separate and and in a static environment where there's only so much to go around. So probably that does contribute to our lack of interest in really allowing other species to flourish and certainly to seeing our, our own thriving being dependent on the thriving of other uh, all the other aspects of our the ecosystems in which we live. So I think it's, it is related to this basic fear of scarcity that I fear is contributed to as we talk about you know, metaphors like hitting the limits of a finite earth, that, that particular one which I hear so much, which puts, keeps us in that fear. Yes, please. Are, are you ready for another one? Okay. Yes, please, thank you. Um, I want to address the point that you're speaking about with regard to scarcity. Yes. There's a new science that's actually an older science going back to people like Nikola Tesla about technologies that are now emerging from the laboratories that tap into the very nature of energy around us, sometimes called zero point, sometimes called out by other terms. And very exciting developments are happening. And they're outlined in two companion volumes for your body, one by Gene Manning called The Coming Energy Revolution, which may be out of print now. But an update of that book is Breakthrough Power by Gene Manning and Joel Garvin. And Joel is head of the organization called the New Energy Movement, with which I'm associated. And it's talking about this exciting new science that's challenging the very paradigms of physics and engineering. Because with, when these come out, and we need the support from venture capitalists and others to bring them out, we will literally be tapping into unlimited power. And of course, there are some that are worried about it, that human beings can't handle this. But I, I'm in an optimistic frame that you're talking about. And this power will be decentralized. It will not be under the domination of centralized power sources. So I want to recommend that to you because I, uh, I noticed it's something that you did not touch upon. No, I will book. definitely follow your advice. Thank you so much. Thank you. I've written it down. Thanks. And even with, even, you know, a, one of the things I point out early in the book when we use the term limits, we hit the limits of a finite earth and just, wait a minute, the sun supplies us 15,000 times the daily dose of energy of what we're currently using in fossil fuels. And that is enormous waste. <laughs> so um, 
that's one of the one of the ways that I, I look at this challenge. Yes, did I see a hand back there, or were you just yes, please? No, no, okay. I saw a hand, but it didn't mean you wanted to speak. Um, yes, there's a hand. It's not. Uh, I've read some of your stuff over the years. Thank you very much for. Uh, it sounds like uh, our species is going from a parasitic relationship with our host to uh, mutual misconduct. Mm -hmm. When you said mutualism, no blame, and you know, look for similarities, that's it's kind of like this permaculture thing that's happening mm -hmm. with a lot of people working in. You know, the, the traps are real, and it's like people people get them reinforced. And yes. they're changing, and as they're transforming, I'm hoping I've been con contributing, and I appreciate what you're doing. It's powerful, powerful. And uh, your mushroom, uh, one of the stories I tell early in the book is my mushroom story. I mean, I've come to think of mushrooms as <laughs> the magic. If there is magic, it's, it's mushrooms. <laughs> 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 they are very amazing. But I, I ended up in this mountain city in, in uh, Colombia, of all places, and in a, in a real poor barrio. Women had discovered that by taking, you know, the massive coffee waste in Colombia and growing mushrooms with it, they could produce this really nutritious food that really hadn't been part of their diet, but they were really seeing how delicious and how it could be incorporated into that diet. And then the waste from what they were doing was fed to livestock. And uh, Gunter Pauly, uh, um, zero, um, zero waste guy, he calculated that if if every coffee farm in the world did that, just with two jobs, it would be like 50 million jobs creating high, high grade, nutritious food, uh, just with the waste from coffee alone. So that is some taste of possibility. So thank you for your comment, and thank you for what you're doing. Yes, please. Can you talk more about the coffee that you can write about? Okay, well let me, let, me, uh, let me start with the growth is the problem thought trap and how I, I handle that, because that really comes early in the book. And um, the, you know, there, it is difficult, because I really so love the, the people who are behind that, that meme, you know, that I mean, they're, they're doing great work, and so I, this is not anything about a criticism of any individual, it's the frame. So, the problem with the growth is our problem, frame, number one, is that it blesses what we've been doing with a positive term. I want my plants to grow. I want my love to grow. I want my granddaughters to grow. Grow is a really positive word. So if we say that what we've been doing is grow, we've already confused ourselves. Because, think about it this way, how can we say we have a growth economy from, when, from anywhere from 55 to 87? I've seen these very credible scientists argue. Some as low as 55, as high as 87% uh, of all the energy in the U.S. is wasted. Is that growth or is that waste? You think about food, food in this country. Over 40% of it that is harvested, ready, you know, healthy, you know, could be food. Over 40% is wasted. And that doesn't even count this waste. That once it's processed, fed to our kids, you know what percentage of those calories are now called empty calories. 40% of American children's diet is empty calories. Is that growth? That's waste. So I think we should be calling our current economy waste and destruction economy. <laughs> 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 so, so okay, but then I, I, um, I agree with those who, and I finally, it, this is one of the things that changed from my first draft to EcoMind, because I had a lot of friends, especially Europeans, who said, Frankie, you cannot say that we should continue to use the word growth for what we want, because that's equally confusing. So I basically say, let's drop 
the term <laughs> growth, no growth, altogether. That has its day, it's not working. And let's begin constantly to use other words. We want vital economies. We want flourishing economies. We want life-serving economies. We want fun economies, right? So let's just drop that language because it is so completely misleading. And also, the other thing I, I do in that first thought leap is to say one of the other problems with the growth is the, the growth is the enemy, you know, the growth is what's killing us. It doesn't make us curious. I use the word curious a lot in this book because an eco mind makes me really curious. If the eco mind is all about connection, I want to know. What is that? How does that connect to that, to connect to that, to connect to that? And if we just say, oh, it's growth, oh, well, we can lower our well, you know, what? It doesn't, it doesn't spark our eco-mind connectedness. And so um, I, I really think it doesn't allow us to see. Why? 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 I say we've got to become two-year-olds again with the eco-mind, asking why, why, why. Why is what we call growth so destructive? because it's locked into what I call a one-rule economy, highest return to existing wealth, which by definition, you know, it returns wealth, returns wealth, returns wealth, until you have what Citigroup in 2005, not friends of all of me, Citigroup called Plutonomy. Well, top 1% controls more wealth than the bottom 90. Mm -hmm. And then that top 1% infuses its, um, its power into our public decision making, so that then, of course, the cost of all the so-called growth is hidden, hidden, hidden. And just as I was finishing this book, a brilliant study came out from Harvard Medical School showing, talking about hidden costs, that just coal alone, coal alone, is a tr third of a trillion dollars a year in costs, if you include all the medical and public health, environment, everything. And so that's another reason we can't call this a growth economy when we're creating that kind of destruction and waste. So um, the, the eco-mind uh, then shifts to, okay, it's the, the leap is to say, uh, what I was just saying really, the what I, way I identify the leap is to say, let's let go of the distorting terminology around growth and let's embrace uh, real, terminology and framing of what is it that actually incorporates the real cost of everything we're doing and moves us toward vitality, health, uh, as I say, joy, uh, exuberance in, in, uh, in the way our economies work and just drop the whole no growth, growth no growth. So that is one example of how I, I move. Um, but one of the most, can I jump to another one though? It, okay. Another one is that, that is this, in the middle is between these two, the consumerism chapter, which I really like too. But the, the, we've hit the limits of a finite earth uh, thought trap. These all obviously relate to one another. But we've hit the limits of a finite planet. You've already heard part of my response is the music metaphor that we're talking about alignment. But I also realized that the problem that with the framing that we've hit the limits of a finite earth is that people hear that, I think, to say, okay, we've hit the limits of what nature can do, so now we've got to improve on nature. And that's what Monsanto, isn't that what they're telling us? <laughs> they're improving on nature. Isn't that the geoengineering people? They're telling us that we're improving on it. Nature can't do it anymore. And so when you and I, if we're tempted to use we've hit the limits of a finite earth, I feel that we're giving ammunition to Monsanto. Because we're saying, no, we haven't begun. In, in, so the alignment theme, and it's so true in agriculture, oh my gosh, as I'm sure many of you know, that as we align our, our agriculture with the laws of nature, and also the joy of farming, because we become artists again instead of just reading instructions from pesticide companies, <laughs> um, that um, there is more than enough. The more than enough, there's a very interesting overview study, one of the most massive done in 2007, in the University of Michigan, that used various models, but they said the most realistic model using organic agriculture worldwide would uh, likely increase production as much as 50%. It would certainly supply all we need now, which we get more than we need now, and uh, for the population as it grows before it begins to level off, which, again, 
that idea that there's some destiny about getting to nine billion is another thing I'd like to <laughs> dissect momentarily in just, in just saying that there's no reason that that has to be true. That nine billion, you know, you hear people saying, oh, we're going to nine billion, oh, we can't be nine billion. What? We're going to nine billion? Because people are disempowered from choosing the size of their families. 95% of population growth is now in the global south. And much of that is from particularly because women uh, don't have uh, say over their fertility, they don't have contraception. There's nothing inevitable about nine billion. It's choices that we're making about inequality in the world and about basic uh, human rights, of which being able to control one's fertility is one. So I just wanted to add that in. But uh, the point is that, that we've hit the limits of a finite Earth um, feeds the idea that somehow now hunger is caused by a lack of food. And I've been fighting that for 40 years. And do you know that we now have about 30% more food per person, even with all the population growth in 40 years? We have 30% more food per person than we did when I was sitting in that ag library in the late 60s. And yet, we have more hunger than ever before. So the hit the limits doesn't begin to make us curious about what are the relationships that create hunger, no matter how much it is produced. And that's why the Monsantos of the world can't offer solutions, because they keep the relationships of power intact. <coughs> and so my, my new thing is when people say, can organic agriculture feed the world? And I say, the real question, can, can chemical, capital-intensive agriculture feed the world? It never has. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we, we, we can say, well, it's had a chance. And we know that organic agriculture, if done in in the way that understands the empowerment of the farmer in community, that then the relationships so shift that people actually have access to the food produced. And one of my favorite stories in the book comes early on, and I hope you get so interested that you'll go to some of the sources. Oh, by the way, we are putting all of our, we have um, a lot of citations in this book, and we're putting all of the URLs, all of the endnotes on our website. We're just updating, because you know how it is, a lot of the URLs are something like 10% are already dated. So you can go to our website and you can click right through. And I'm going to be adding additional things that, that came in just a little bit too late. But one of the things I highly recommend, if you want inspiration, if you want to see what we're capable of, especially you women, uh, read about what's happening in Andhra Pradesh, India, the pesticide capital of the world. And there, a women-led movement, uh, they call it the non-pesticide movement, this women-led movement, you'll read about the Deccan Development Society, where people got so burnt, uh, devastated by BT cotton, by GMO cotton that failed, and they began to say there must be a better way, and to reclaim not only their traditional uh, multi-cropping systems, but also building on it, sharing seeds, growing it, and now this particular, and, and also creating their own village level uh, food security system instead of just relying on the white rice from the centralized system, which was making a lot of them you know, ill because it was so lacking in nutrition. Anyway, it's an, it's an amazing story now in 125 villages feeding about 50,000 people and the entire state of Andhra Pradesh uh, through the Ministry of Agriculture is, is, is in, in beginning to embrace this and organizations at a village level where people are coming together. And at least, I don't know what it is in Hindi, but the translation of the key person in the village who's responsible for bringing people together, animating them, they call it the village activist. <laughs> in the English show. Yeah, so there's a, lot, there's a lot of encouragement. And which um, reminds me of uh, a key piece at the end of this book is, um, reminding us that that way that I felt when I left that conference, that led feeling, that we talk about mutual responsibility and mutual accountability instead of that, just the blame game, that part of taking, making ourselves accountable is changing our mental map of being responsible for the, the mind that we are creating by looking for stories of possibility, bringing them into our lives on a weekly, if not daily basis. And that's why I'm so proud to be associated with uh, Solutions Journal, which is located here. Anybody here from Solutions? 
Uh, I'm speaking tomorrow at PSU, and that's where their home is. If you're not a subscriber, Solutions Journal. If you're not a subscriber to Yes Magazine, that's another uh, magazine I'm associated with that I'm so excited about. There is, the, in the back of Ecomind, or any number of e-newsletters you can bring into your inbox and click on them if you want to send the possibility. Because that's what, that's what begins to shift the frame from this, it's all over, oh my god, the scarcity scare, to possibility. So I think there are other questions. Um, yes, you, You've touched on a lot of this. First, I want to thank you so much for such an inspiring evening here at Powell's. Um, you can, had, you can you hear? You oh. had you had touched on speaking about finite Earth. I was wondering if you could somehow address the concept of finite government. Finite um, government. Um, <laughs> I like it. How we might be able to better reclaim our own power and create this world. Thank that, you. Thank you. Well, a key a song that I've been singing uh, since the 1980s. I had this great sound bite I would use, and I would say. Hunger is not caused by scarcity of food, it's caused by scarcity of democracy. And I thought I sounded really smart. And then I realized people were looking at me and saying, okay, where is that democracy that is vital and strong enough to actually address hunger? And now, of course, to address climate change and species decimation and all that we're facing. So I, in the 1980s, I, I started going kind of what I thought of as beneath all the issues to what does democracy look like that's really aligned with our nature and therefore workable. And that's where I started calling it living democracy. So one of the things toward the end of the book in that it's too late chapter, I say that it's too late if we don't have a really believable vision of democracy that where we can come together um, and make decisions by genuine dialogue, like I, I mentioned the Texans who went for renewable energy, um, that we have to believe that that is possible. Because if we're creating a world that none of us as individuals would choose, by definition that means that democracy has failed, because our voices aren't in the mix, right? Because we wouldn't choose this. So a key to this, and do not allow your eyes to glaze over when I say this, <laughs> key to it is getting money out of our political system. Yes. And believing we can do it. Believing we can do it. And I, I think that, uh, just one thing, and I think, I see it. I think that, um, that, you know, if we say we can't do that, then <laughs> what do we think we can do? <laughs> and that's why, if you'll read about, and you can go, my son's a filmmaker, so I work with both of my kids, and he made a film about my superhero, Deb Simpson. So if you want to have a meaning, if you want to have a person that you can hold of what could happen if we really had clean elections, is uh, see Deb Simpson. Now, Deb Simpson, in 2000, this is May, 80% of the legislators in Maine have run clean without corporate money because they have voluntary public financing. 80% taking part in this. So that Deb, who was a single mom, a high school educated person, who was a waitress, she was picked out by her friends and said, Deb, you, you know, you're a natural leader. Why don't you run for office? And she thought they were crazy because she had no money and no name. And then she learned that all she had to do was get five dollars from 50 people. And she said, oh, I'm a waitress. I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> so Deb ran one, and she's taken such, she's shown to be such a leader. Think about this. She was chosen to sit on the Judiciary Committee for the state of Maine. She was chosen as co-chair of it. She now sits on the National Natural Resources Committee. And she was part of what allowed Maine to withstand the onslaught of corporate pressure, because 80% of the legislators had not taken money from corporations, and they were able to pass the, one of the best producer responsibility, this is in regard to electronic equipment, one of the best producer responsibility laws ever, and that has kept, even this was a few years ago, has kept a pound of lead out of that beautiful state for every single citizen of Maine. So that's the kind of thing that can happen. And I know it's very discouraging that in January of 2010, our Supreme Court 
saw fit to define democracy as unleashing corporate spending. I refuse to call it by, you know, what the name they call it by. <laughs> it is that awful, awful decision that 80% of Americans disagree with. We are not the minority. It is commonsensical. Corporations are not persons. I, I get into that in this book, too, and explain why that's so crazy, if, as if anybody couldn't see it. But, um, so there, you know, this is common ground. This is common ground. Because 80% of Americans think that was a terrible decision. 90, almost 90% 90 of us think that corporations have too much power in Washington. So creating the forums, creating the movements in which we can come together on that core insight of democracy being a place where we all have voice and that money is sidelined. And I include the most powerful statement on this in this book from Franklin Delano Roosevelt. In April of 1938, he was addressing a joint session of Congress. And he said very simply, the liberty of democracy is not safe if a people tolerate the growth of private power to the point that it is stronger than the democratic state itself, that, in its essence, is fascism. Mm. Oh. And I joke with myself that. Should we keep that? Just say it one more time. Well, it's in the book. You've got to buy the book. It sounds great. Okay. I'll, I'll get it. If you don't want to buy the book, I'll show you where it is. It took me a long time to find, you know, to really verify exactly the source and everything that was in the book. Um, but I, I joke with myself and think, you know, Frankie, when are you going to get the nerve to use the F word without quoting Franklin Delano <laughs> Roosevelt? I'm still working on it. But he defined it so clearly. Private power stronger than the democratic state itself. That's where we are. And so we've got to get serious. We've got to, we can't let it glaze over. What, so whatever, all my buddies who are part of the environmental movement, the food movement, oh, can I say, do any of you have friends in New York City? Yes. Okay. Write this down. Go to smallplanetfund.org and come to our big, big event next week, September 22nd. Fonda and the Shiva is coming. We have a thousand room on a tour and we're going to celebrate 40 years of the food movement in New York City. It's free, open to the public. My daughter's going to host. Um, and I'm really excited. So if you know anybody in New York City, tell them to go to Small Planet Fund. They'll, they can register to go to our big party next week. So all my buddies in the food movement, environmental movement, et cetera, et cetera, I say, okay, this does not have to be your first obligation, but you know, your first passion, I should say. I hate that word obligation. Your first passion. But whatever else you're doing, we can all weigh in on this, on this matter of removing money from politics. There is now a bill both in the House and the Senate. In the House, it has about 75 co-sponsors. Fair Elections Now legislation, you can go to that website and you can weigh in, you can tell your friends and neighbors about it, you can contact your legislators about it. This should be something that is bipartisan as well as the Disclose Act. Would, do you know that the Disclose Act, which would have forced corporations to identify who they're giving their contributions to in the campaigns, lost by one vote? Mm. One vote. Where were we? Where were we? So we can, whatever else we're doing, I'm not asking you to make that your, if you, I'd love it if you made it your primary issue. <laughs> But if you're involved in all sorts of things you love, you could also love this and love talking about it because it gets real. So, yes, you had a question back there. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be quick. Uh, I agree with uh, getting money out of uh, politics and perhaps shortening the election cycle and getting the law just the hell out of uh, Washington, D.C. So we can get back to our democracy and get out of the fashion state. I just want to say I appreciate your uh, uh, tone of positivity, uh, that abundance and, uh, and energy and I think it's reflective of uh, Al Gore's positions and uh, the counteract the culture of fear that's happening right now. For instance, one of the lead stories on TV tonight was the bankruptcy of Soldine, I don't know if I have that right, yeah. a portable tank plant based in Northern California that uh, Obama went to last year. They got about half a billion in stimulus funds and they're finally bankruptcy. So everybody's going, oh yeah, so solar doesn't work, does it? Whereas, you know, right. they had the solar, like you mentioned, in Bellingham and Germany's doing it. And, Work, but we got to change the mental paradigm on that. And we've got to change the legal framework. Indeed. Germany is going to be 40% renewable electricity by, in 10 years because of one piece of legislation. I think you have some version, some, I don't know enough about it, but 
here, but it's this, they call it in Europe, the feed-in tariff, but it's basically, I call it the reward renewables law. So now, the 80% of the installations in wind and solar in Germany are all households who are seeing themselves as producers. So they're in, you know, they're in it. They're, 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 they're part of the solution. And, and they're going to be 40% renewable. And it avoids the, uh, the uh, making of new power, or nuclear power plants, I believe. Absolutely. Uh, just one thing I want to mention real quick is Al Gore is doing an event right now online, oh. started at 7 o'clock tonight around the world. I believe it's at uh, climaterealityproject.org. Just check it Thank out. You. It's a 24 hour event with people with stories uh, indicating what's actually happening in their part of the world and what's happening to our climate that is real. Mm -hmm. uh, this bunk fantasy non science that seems uh, bandied about. I Thank you. I'll Thank you. I wish I had mentioned that. I'm so glad you mentioned it. Yeah, check it out. And I hope we can. Whatever we we can catch it, even if we're not there right now. So thank you so much for that. So I think you wanted to end. One more. I, I love your comments, questions. One more to yes, please. There. Um, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on testing meat. I mean, I've been reading so much about it. Testing meat. Well, it's, isn't it sort of what I was saying before? Since we've reached the limits of the nature, we've got to go beyond nature. I mean, it's completely... Tis true. Tis Think about the vast abundance. Right now, just to give you the big picture, only half of the grain produced in the world actually goes to people directly in this world where a billion of us go without. More than, uh, roughly 37% of the world's grain now goes to produce animal products, right? Another 30% or so, third or roughly, of the fish catch. That didn't even, wasn't even thought of when I wrote Diet for Small Planet. We've done to fish what we've done to cattle. We've made them, you know. Uh. So, um, so to think that, that in addition, we're going to be doing test tubes to focus on meat. I mean, the point is that, uh, we, that we know, we know that human beings thrive in a largely plant-centered diet in which if one chooses to eat animal foods, they are complementary, not the center of the meal, that that was a big mistake that we made in Texas. <laughs> um, so um, just, the, just the idea that we are spending any of our energy focusing on yet another way to produce meat, you'll have to understand, as the author of Diet for Small Planet, it's, it's, not, it's not where, um, but, but I do think it's, it's a reflection of this idea, this fixation that somehow Nature can't do it, and um, and yet so many people are coming to realize how much healthier and vital they feel in a primarily plant-centered diet. Again, it, with animal foods uh, playing a complementary role. So I don't mean to. I, I'm sorry. It, it, um, I hope that's okay to answer that way. Um, <laughs> that I'm going to be around, and uh, I um, and also if you want more tomorrow, I'm going to give a more formal lecture tomorrow at 1.30 at PSU, and that will be, you know, tonight I was just felt like I just wanted to come and chat about the book. Tomorrow it will be a more formal lecture, and um, would love to have any of you there. Maybe if you've had enough, you can tell other people uh, to about that. And also know that if you do get the book and read it, I am just eager to engage. Uh, I've never, I mean, I've always felt that way, but I've always felt a little bit hesitant, too, about nobody likes to be criticized. But I, I feel like uh, right now that I know that, that this was all so new for me to put this out. And I feel like I'm just a learner. I'm just, I don't, you know, so I had this idea that I somehow was an expert on hunger. That was, that was crazy. But, um, but this is all like I'm just out there as an explorer with the readers. So please, um, please engage with me. Uh, Give me new, more powerful examples of the ones that are in here. Give me counter examples that I have to grapple with. But we're going to have a discussion section on smallplanet.org. And I, and I, as I am, I'm going to be putting uh, more and more stories up there that couldn't fit in the book. And you can also get the, all the resources where the links are broken. Uh, you can get updated links. So please know that we at Small Planet are eager collaborators with you. And uh, we want to become better spokespeople for a frame that really does energize and just make people want to join in to the most <coughs> compelling historic moment for our species. And thank you, thank you for coming tonight.